Hello. Slightly longer than usual turnaround of videos um, because I've had a couple of assignments and I've also submitted a PhD proposal um, all in the space of about a week and a half. Um, so sorry about that, but hopefully the, the proposal might yield things that I can talk about for future videos if, it, if anything comes of it. Um, but yeah, so ever since the early 2000s when my sort of first memories were forming, I remember that people in southeastern British English were using the word like in a couple of colloquial ways that didn't match uh, the sort of traditional dictionary definitions, although I think most dictionaries now do include these uh, these usages. They may even have had them in at that time. Um, and I, 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 I associated both of these ways of using the word with colloquial speech, but I don't think I considered them to be related to each other or closely related to each other at the time. Obviously, I was a kid, so I didn't didn't know much about well, I didn't know anything about linguistics. Um, but I don't think I I don't think I clocked that they might be related to each other. Um, one of these was the use of like as what I now realise is a kind of discourse marker, which is kind of poorly defined. Um, every every paper defines it slightly differently, but um, it's a, a a a bit of speech that's used to kind of manage the structure and flow of conversation I think is, is the definition that's that's often used although that's that's very vague and it can also be used in a quotative way so like he was like I was like uh, to quote somebody and clumsily in the last video I said um, that it had in some places supplanted the word say um, but as many people pointed out it's not uh, it doesn't completely overlap in meaning with the verb to say um, because it can be used to report not just what somebody says, but also maybe how they react, or it can paraphrase what they've said. So John turned around and realised that I'd been listening to him talking about me, and he was like, oh fuck. That doesn't necessarily mean that he said, oh fuck, but it means that he reacted in that way. Um, maybe internally, you could imagine him saying, oh fuck, in, in, in his head. Um, but yeah, I, I've been aware of these usages in British English since the early 2000s, and I think since then um, I, I have thought of them as something that's probably come from American English because um, teachers were always sort of um, getting in people's business about using American, what they perceived to be Americanisms, because obviously there's this whole stigma about American English worse than British English for some, I, I, you know, I mean, it's just jingoism really, isn't it? But um, yeah, so teachers would say things like, you weren't like going to lunch, you were going to lunch, you know, they'd correct people in that way. I think um, some a friend pointed out to me recently that there was a girl at secondary school in science who, who said like so much that one of the teachers started making a tally of it on the whiteboard. Um, and I had a friend sort of, when I was very young, sort of 2003, maybe 2004, who would overuse like as a discourse marker to kind of take the piss out of people who did that because he'd already started noticing it at that age. Now, at this point, I can't remember really whether it was as common back then as it is now. Um, I would have guessed not, but I don't, that's just from recollection. I don't have any evidence for that. But yeah, I, I assume this had come from the US, I think, because when I was a kid, one of the big sort of stereotypical people that did this was Shaggy from Scooby-Doo, um, who, who uses like as a discourse marker perhaps more than most actual people would. In 2005, Alexandra Faith Darcy finished a thesis, I think it was a PhD thesis, in which they analysed how people use like as a discourse marker in Toronto and showed that it was actually very systematic. And when they looked at people of different ages and compared how they use like as a discourse marker, they found a pattern of grammaticalization that's happened over the last 80 or 90 years um, in which like has started off as a preposition, it sounds like music and has ended up as a discourse marker, like he said he'd be there. Something Darcy points out that I've noticed myself is that using like to shape an entire sentence isn't that new. So enter my favourite dialect, Cumbrian. These fellas about here with guests that fell, you know, they've all these big heavy shows, like they get to made a purpose to get that fell, like. Or really any far northern English dialect, um, or Scottish English or Scots, or at least several varieties of Irish English, where like is used as a sentence adverb attached after the sentence to modify it. And a sentence adverb is a word that tells you about the speaker's attitude towards the entire utterance. So 
obviously he's not coming back, or they've been sacked, basically. In the UK dialects I've just listed, like is used in this way, and it's attached to the end of an utterance. He's gone to the party lake. Although I've heard this from friends and family members, I don't do it myself, and I've had a hard time trying to work out where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate. On the face of it, this is different from the discourse marker that seems to have come from American English, um, but they may actually be related to each other. So in Darcy's sample from Toronto, um, how, how do speakers use like as a discourse marker? What situations do they use it in? It's important to note that this is different from the use of like as a crutch word. So if somebody pauses and it's part of their dialect and they can't think of what to say next, they may use like in the place of like um or er. Uh. Um, but this is this is talking about in rapid speech when they you know the person knows what they're going to say how do they use the word like as a discourse marker it can appear before numeric expressions i'm reading off my phone at this point um i can't remember all of these so it appears before numeric expressions it took like 15 minutes almost in the same way as you'd use about in standard english like it took about 15 minutes it appears at the starts of clauses in rapid speech so like when I went to town, I saw him, or alternatively, when I went to town, like I saw him. It appears as a determiner before noun phrases, so a noun phrase is a short phrase that includes a noun and the adjectives and articles describing it, like the brown dog, or a cat, or bear. Um, so an example of that would be, I kicked like the ball into the fence. It appears as a modifier before adjectives, so he'll get like really upset, or she's a really like happy person. Um, and it can go before verbs, so, and they'd like broken in. So seeing all of these examples, seeing all of these situations where it can be used, you might ask, well, doesn't that just mean it can be used basically anywhere? And you can answer that on two counts. So firstly, there are positions in a sentence where Darcy didn't record any of the speakers in the sample using like. So um, speakers didn't produce sentences like, they like it just on my bed. Uh, or it's fine to say he's like five feet tall, but it'd be weird to say he's five like feet tall. You know, in the middle of a numeric expression, unless you're pausing to think, you wouldn't use that discourse marker. And another point of difference that's perhaps more interesting to the sort of historical linguistics audience is that people of different ages in the data set use the word differently. And this is maybe not surprising because I think, at least in Southern Britain, we're all aware that many older people consider like to be a kind of modern corruption um, of the language. Um, but it, it, it's systematic in that the oldest speakers in the sample used it in a more grammatically restricted s series of situations. And as you get younger and younger, you see people bringing in more situations in which it's appropriate to use it one after the other. So. Darcy's dissertation suggests that like started off being used in a more restricted range of contexts and over time it's been used in more and more grammatical contexts in a fairly predictable sequence from one um, from one maximal projection to the next um, and it doesn't doesn't matter too much what a maximal projection is I don't 100% understand myself because I'm not a syntax person um, but uh, if you are a syntax person the the thesis goes into a lot of detail about it and Darcy uses um, the idea of um, apparent time to measure this. So if a speaker is older um, and they have a more restricted range of context in which they'd use the word like, and then somebody 20 years younger has a slightly larger range of context where they'd use it, a speaker 20 years younger than that has a slightly la larger range of context where they'd use it, that suggests that over time uh, there has been this progression. And that, that doesn't mean to say that older people don't pick up new, you know, new ways of speaking when they're in their 50s, 60s, 70s, because obviously they do. Um, but the fact that you see this progression from, you know, a specific range of context expanding outwards does suggest uh, a, a progression over time. So maybe if you went back to the 1950s, 1960s, um, maybe even 1940s, you'd find speakers in Toronto using like in a more specific range of context that's predictable by Darcy's model. One of the most important points Darcy makes, I think, um, although they might disagree, 
is that the way that like has developed as a discourse marker over time, um, the situate, you know, the increase in the situations in which it can be used has very closely paralleled the development of other discourse markers in history, like indeed. So this pattern of progression um, has has a lot of historical precedent, and so it's not not too surprising that like seems to have made this journey a couple of times in very similar ways, maybe more than a couple of times. Using like as a sentence adverb, as some Northern English speakers do, he was coming back like, is earlier in this template path of development that Darcy suggests. Um, and using it throughout the structure of a sentence, like a lot of younger people do nowadays, is later in that path of development. That doesn't mean to say that young people in California and Toronto evolved their usage from earlier Northern English and Scottish speakers, it's more likely that the word like has fallen into a very similar path of development multiple times. And you can see this by sifting through historical literature, which Darcy does at the start of the dissertation. Um, and they find that attaching like to the end of a clause or sentence historically wasn't just a Northern English thing. Father grew quite uneasy like for fear of his lordship's taking office. This was recorded in Bath, 1778. Wright's English dialect dictionary from 1902 shows it in a non-clause final position. He would not go like through that. They're like against one another as it is. And Darcy lists examples from elderly people from Ayrshire and Scotland that map surprisingly well onto how modern younger speakers use the word. We were doing like a nature study. They were just like sitting waiting to die. This is a complicated pattern because it does seem that this path of development for the word like has occurred fairly independently in several different dialects of English and these usages mix together so there are probably Northern English, in fact I think I know Northern English speakers nowadays who use the older Northern English clause final usage and also use the modern um, probably American influenced usage throughout a sentence. So you know these, these, um, these paths of development can sort of collide with each other. Um, in interesting ways, which I don't know if they've been studied, they probably, someone's bound to have thought about it at least. Um, so the the pattern here across dialects is probably too complicated to unweave, um, and it doesn't mean that it's a foregone conclusion that the word like would slip into use as a discourse marker like this in any dialect of English, it's just that when it does happen it happens according to a, a particular um, almost template of development, or at least there's a certain common path that it's likely to follow. So how do we then get like in a quotative sense? I was like, he went to work. Jim reached out to me like a year ago and he was like, oh, this is exciting. I was like, yeah, we got a class coming up. And you had a chance to look at my slime yet, you know? And he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. Later, later, later. People of a range of ages do this nowadays in North American English and also in British English for what it's worth but it doesn't seem to have been recorded before about 1980. There are lots of journal articles on this phenomenon. Um, the earliest focused one I can find is from 1990, uh, and that describes it as a recent phenomenon in American English, and the authors immediately describe to be like in pretty much the same way as I did at the start of this video, so it can be used to introduce a direct quote or paraphrasing, or just somebody's non-verbal reaction. And they reference an earlier article from 1986 that touches on people using like in this way. Uh, and they say that middle class American teenagers are most likely to use it. And then a 1989 paper says that it's sometimes used in African American English as well. So we're looking more solidly at something that's emerged in the 1980s in the US or possibly the late 70s. Given that the earliest reference to it in academia that I can find is from 1982, it, it seems unlikely that the first journal article to mention it would be written at exactly the time that people started using it. So it seems likely that people were using it in the late 70s in, in, in some places, in some contexts, uh, but that's just inference. There's a later paper that records these forms in Glasgow in 1997, um, which is of course shortly before I, my first memories are appearing um, of uh, it being used in southern England in sort of the early 2000s. So by this point it seems to have uh, arrived in the UK and this, this Glasgow paper does assume that it's derived from uh, US usage um, and it goes a bit into the sociolinguistics of it which is quite interesting. And one of the reasons it might be going so far and being so successful as a quotative is that it occupies this niche where 
Um, it's very versatile. You can use it to directly quote someone or you can use it to paraphrase someone or you can use it to just give someone's reaction. And I, I don't know, it, this is maybe going a bit too interpretive with it, but I think uh, one of the good things about it is that it's, um, it allows you to capture the way that maybe we actually remember dialogue when we're reporting it. So when we have a conversation, for me at least, when I go away from a conversation, often I don't remember exactly what was said by every speaker in the conversation in order. Like I'll remember certain quotes if they were funny or if they were particularly striking. But what I mainly remember is the, the overall shape of the discussion, so how people reacted, how people seemed to feel about what other people were saying. Um, and using to be like as a quotative allows you to describe that overall shape of the conversation without kind of committing you to any, you know, the specifics of any exact quote that you might make. So uh, it, it doesn't require you to make up the wording that somebody might have used because you can't remember the exact wording, but you can remember the, you know, the general feeling of what they were saying. Um, and I think that, that that's one of the reasons that I quite like it although I don't think most people think that deeply about it. I think they just pick it up from people they know. Um, but yeah, that, that versatility might be one of the reasons why it's, um, it's spread so widely and it's been so successful over the last 30 or 40 years. There's a 1991 paper um, that recorded the grammaticalization process early on, um, and this paper also suggested that using quotative like is useful because it lets the speaker get across their perspective of what happened without committing themselves to absolute accuracy. And something I would add is that it also enables you to twist the truth a bit if you want to, so it adds that thin layer of plausible deniability where if someone were to call you out for misquoting them, you could just say, oh well I wasn't directly quoting you, that's just the impression I got. Um, not that I think that's how it's used most of the time, but that you know it does have that function as well and that is a social function of it. And this 1991 paper goes into a bit of detail about how this construction popped up in the first place. Um, and there's, there's a lot of interesting syntax detail in there that I'm not qualified to um, go into, uh, although I'd encourage you to give it a read if you're interested in that kind of thing. And it runs through some quotes, and some of those look to me like kind of proto-forms of like being used as a quotative. So Matt goes something like, no way. So there, an existing quotative, to go, is used in conjunction with the phrase something like. And that shows more explicitly that what follows isn't a direct quote, it's just paraphrasing, basically. Another interesting example is, and people would get like, oh my god. Because in that situation, the quotation, oh my god, is used to illustrate the state of surprise that people are in. So this kind of blurs the line between describing the state people are in and reporting how they actually reacted. So although the actual development is hard to unpick and probably very complicated, maybe it started off with people using quotative like to actually describe what they were like, what state they were in, using an example of a quotation that they might have said in that state. So you could express the same thought as, he was like a deer in the headlights, or he was like, oh god, what do I do? And once that kind of usage has become normal, people can then generalise it to other situations where they're quoting people. So I think that's, that seems like a fairly plausible path of development for, you know, for that, that construction. One thing that I've noticed is that I had made the rookie mistake of thinking of this as a, almost like a phrasal verb, like to turn on or to bring about or to go under or something like that. Um, and of, of course, it doesn't quite work in the same way as a phrasal verb because, um, you know, I mean, there are certain situations where you wouldn't use to be like you'd use a different, um, you'd use you'd use a different verb. So, for example, I could say which light did he turn on, or I could say which business went under, or I could say, uh, you know, something like that. But I couldn't say what was he like if I'm asking what he said. You know, if I asked what was he like, that would be interpreted in a different way. It'd be interpreted as was he nice. You know, what was his personality like? So the range of situations where you can use this quotative like is, is narrower than that of a, of a normal verb. So I, if I have ever described it as a verb, which I think I probably have, that, that's me 
not knowing enough about syntax, <laughs> so apologies for that. But yeah, hopefully this has been an interesting little dive into, into what I think is an interesting feature of modern English. Um, and maybe after this video, somebody who's annoyed by these um, features of modern speech might be less annoyed by them, although everybody has obviously the right to be annoyed by whatever they want to be annoyed by. But yeah, thank you very much for watching, and I will talk to you soon.